Buenas tardes. Bienvenidos al Anderson Ranch y muchas gracias por estar aquí hoy. Thank you for being here today. My name is Beatriz Soto and I'm going to be your moderator today. Um, I grew up locally. I've been in the Roaring Fork Valley for over 25 years. Um, some of you might know Voces Unidas de las Montañas. It's the first Latino-led, Latino-serving um, advocacy group in our area, and I am one of the founding members of Voces Unidas de las Montañas. Um, I currently um, direct a statewide program around environmental issues, climate change, and um, making sure that we have a strong democracy as we face a changing climate and making sure that Latinos' priorities and voices are elevated as we craft a more resilient future moving forward. It gives me great, great pleasure to be on this, uh, moderating this panel tonight, and thank you very much for the Anderson Ranch for inviting me. Um, it's been a pleasure both to meet um, these amazing artists. Before I introduce them, I wanna make sure that we acknowledge um, Anne and Chris Reyes Foundation. The foundation has provided funding that has allowed the ranch to develop a multifaceted three-year program in support of Latinx arts and education. Muchas gracias. Also, muchas gracias to the Anderson team for bringing this program to life. It was very much needed and the timing is perfect. Many of us have spent the day today with Ron and Maria as part of the second annual Latinx art and education workshops. Thank you all for taking the time of being here today, and we had an awesome opportunity to do the same workshop with students yesterday. So it's an amazing program. Um, really quick, I'm gonna give some backgrounds on both of the artists. Um, you should have their bios and the handouts, but just so we refresh. Maria de Los Angeles, is a Mexican-born American artist who addresses ideas of migration, belonging, and identity through her drawing, painting, and printmaking and wearable sculptures. She holds an MFA of Yale School of Art, a BFA from Pratt Institute, and an associate degree from Santa Rosa Junior College. Maria was awarded the Blair Dickinson Memorial Prize by Yale University and her, for her artwork and her role within her community. Muchas gracias, Maria, y bienvenida. Ronaldo Rael is a professor and the Eva Lee Memorial Chair in Architecture in the Department of Architecture in the College of Environmental Design and is chair of the Department of Art Practice at the University of California, Berkeley. His research interests connect indigenous and traditional material practices to contemporary technologies and issues. And he is considered to be a design activist, author, and thought leader within the topics of additive manufacturing, border wall studies, and earthen architecture. Bienvenido, Ronaldo. So to start guiding our conversations and our questions, I want to start with the personal. Our, sto our stories are so important. Histories from our ancestors, our families, the experiences of our lives, they really shape who we are. Each of us has our own path of becoming towards our full potential self. I was wondering if you can both share a little bit about your journey to becoming the artist you are today, the designer you are today, and what that looked like for you. How did that journey feel for you? Maria, would you wanna kick us off, or yeah, go Ronaldo? Ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I grew up in, kind of a very extreme environment. I grew up in a very small village of 24 people. They were the only people I knew in a very remote place in Southern Colorado on a sheep ranch. And, um, you know, growing up on a, in a place like that, you learn a lot about how to do everything. 
and how to build your house, how to uh, grow food, how to raise animals, um, and in, in a very tight, small community. And that community was a community that also shrunk over time, and so there was a lot of abandoned buildings uh, that were falling apart, and there was a lot of um, making as a part of everyday life, including food. Uh, and so I think that journey for me has always been one about the relationship to the land, to material, to the communities that are involved in making life happen. And I, I probably didn't realize all of that was a reality until I left it and I went to the university. And once I was in the university, I was in an entirely different world, and, and upon that reflection, I realized um, what a special place that was and how that place can inform the way you shape your world outside of that community. I don't know, that's my, that's it. <laughs> so how does this show up in your work? So how does it show up in my work? Um, well, I have to mention that, you know, the, the southern part of Colorado, south of the Arkansas River, was Mexico for a very long time, uh, until 1848. And so the, the remnants of that history still exist in our language and our food and our culture and customs. And one thing that is very um, important to me and one thing that I realized, especially probably since around 2001, is that the same things that were happening in the historic US-Mexican border, especially related to my own family, were the things that are happening again today. And so on that, in that historic Mexican-American border in Colorado, children were being taken away from their families. Um, there was a militarization of that border. And also, children were being taken away from their families and put into a kind of form of slavery. And when I started working at the contemporary U.S.-Mexico border, I saw the similarities. It was almost like history was repeating itself. And so I started to create work that acknowledged and tried to tie together an expanded idea of what the borderlands are, the contemporary borderlands and the historic borderlands, and how uh, a sign like this, which is a sign that warns motorists that migrants who were trafficked and dropped off the side of the road and were, might run across the highway so they wouldn't get hit, is very similar in a way to the kinds of migrations that occurred in the historic US-Mexico border, and that that young girl in that previous sign is the same girl as my grandmother or my great-grandmother who was taken away from her family and given away to someone as a child. And so these are the stories that I'm trying to tell through these works and trying to um, re reunite not only bring attention to these issues, but uh, reunite our understanding of history and contemporary politics. Gracias. Yeah. I'm gonna repeat the, the question. Yeah, I yeah. feel like. <laughs> So each of us has our own path of becoming towards our full potential self. Share a little bit about you, Maria, about your journey of becoming the artist and designer you are today and what that journey looked like for you. I feel like we only have, what, 30 minutes? OK, so I'm going to summarize this. Well, first, I want to say thank you to Olivia for having me here, for bringing me, and to the team. Well, I guess. You know, I was born in Mexico and I came to the United States in 1999 with my family. And while the United States, I guess, has always been really impactful on the continent, on the whole, the Americas, it didn't really have that much of an impact to me at that time. I grew up in the south of Mexico and uh, that was a very extreme contrast to Northern California, Sonoma County, uh, a really kind of heavily agricultural um, area, vineyards, farming. And that, in a way, was similar to my upbringing in Mexico, because I grew up um, you know, in that kind of lifestyle, the farming. And you know, when I arrived, I really realized, and I already used to draw when I was back there, and I realized that I, I really like art. And it really supported me through the transition as a newcomer uh, to the United States while I learned English and um, through like the whole academic process of assimilating into many of your educators into the schools. And that allowed me to, to kind of 
calm my nerves a little bit because it can be kind of scary to be in school at that, at that level, coming uh, as a new person to the States and speaking, not speaking the language. Um, when I graduated from high school, I decided that I wanted to go to San Rosa Junior College to study art. And that was sort of like the first move towards finding art as a way to, to speak, to, to share stories, to create something beautiful. Uh, I think for me, beauty and kind of bringing up things that we all have in common is a way to, uh, to bring change, to unify, to bring us together. You know, and that kind of took me to applying for school. I went to Pratt Institute and there I got to really study quite a bit of art really going to French or Impressionism, like really dabble on pretty much everything. I tried everything. I was one of those people always on campus studying. And I think my major moment of, okay, what is it that once you have all the tools, what do you want to say, really came about when I went to graduate school at the Yale School of Art, really thinking about who I was, what, how I wanted to kind of develop my work and how I spoke about my work. And there I really thought about how growing up on documents had been a really kind of big part of my upbringing that I wish wasn't really part of it. Uh, you know, that I didn't have to think about those things when I was within my own country, within Mexico. And now being here in this place that I call home, what does that mean? And I'm really interested in like the political and the personal and that intersection and how we can bring stories that um, make us see things in a new way. And so I think that for me, art is a way of transformation. And ultimately, I believe that art is freedom itself. Um, you know, it's, a, it's, it's actually the ultimate for me to, to be here, to be an artist, and to get to travel and meet people and build community through art. Liberation, I love it. Um, you both, I think, alluded to community, to the we. Um, and it seems really obvious in both of your work that you take a lot of inspiration from community and culture. Um, and often co-create with others. Um, can you share one of your favorite stories of how people or communities that you have worked with have really impacted your work? And, and really like this reciprocal relationship with community, maybe how some of your work has also um, changed community and how community has changed you. Oh, okay. I think this is a really great question because art can be somewhat solitary and you do get caught up in like your own biography and like your own making and your ideas and, and the studio can in a way connect you but also disconnect you from people. And so I've, you know, over the last eight years since I finished my in my master's degree or so, I have really been thinking about community as a type of collaborator and trying to kind of get outside of my head a little bit. And I have done things where I've built wearable sculpture with, within community and um, collaborated at the Lower East Side Girls Club in New York where we built a monumental garment. And I've done performances where I bring community in to like wear the sculptures and do kind of like parade or like fashion, like more like like more fashion oriented, but staying within performance art and within fine art. I also lately have been really active in muralism. So this last summer I finished three uh, 20 by 20 foot or a little bit larger than that murals, uh, two exterior murals. One was painted by me alone and the other one was painted in collaboration with community. Uh, about um, over a hundred different people came through ranging from very little kids like we had yesterday to senior citizens and people with like Alzheimer's and uh, people who support um, those communities. And it was a really fantastic workshop where people when added to the mural itself, their voices. Because I, as a storyteller, I think about like what voices I'm sharing through my perspective, but it's always really great to work with people and have them put their unique touch to work. So muralism, um, is for me something that I'm going to keep doing and that I'm really quite excited about because of the history of muralism linking back to Mexico and also the Italian fresco tradition. So I'm really, that's really where I'm, I'm headed to the monumental scale murals. Um, are you gonna repeat the question for me? No, I'm just kidding. I, I, no, I, um, I, I think that um, this, uh, this idea of community for me is, uh, 
in relationship to the border is really an important issue, um, especially because from my perspective, the materialization of the wall along the border separated communities. It literally separated cities from each other and, and separates neighborhoods and separates families uh, from their children in some cases. And so the, the project that I did on the border called Teeter Totter Wall was meant to demonstrate how um, there were alternative ways to bring communities together through very simple acts. And that particular project was very sensational in a way, but it has allowed me to do what I feel are much more meaningful acts of bringing communities together. So after that project, um, I was invited to do a lot of things, and some of the things were ridiculous and some were crazy, but the one that I really invested in was working with the international humanitarian aid organization, um, the uh, ALIGHT, they used to be known as the American Refugee Committee, to work in migrant shelters and bring design to migrant shelters to improve the lives of migrants who were coming to uh, those shelters. And what I learned there is that a community has to be formed within a migrant shelter comprised of people from all over the world, really. So they're not only people from uh, Latin America, but from the Caribbean, from Russia, from uh, China, from India. And they're all ending up in this place along the border. And one of the strategies in, in establishing a community in a place where maybe people, in some cases, especially during the Trump administration, were trapped for a very long time, was to build mud ovens. And the mud ovens allowed people to assert their own traditions related to the simple act of fire and cooking and the communal act of building the oven together. And so in the, in the mud oven on the left, uh, that was built in Nogales, and it was a fairly large oven, and that gentleman there, he was the son of uh, panaderos, bread makers in the community in Guatemala. And he and I built this Orno together with everyone in the community. But now that Orno, they make um, 250 loaves of bread every two days that feed the migrant shelter. And they start to make enough bread to feed the community outside the migrant shelter as well. So they're reconnecting not only internally, but externally. And that, to me, even though that project is not sensational or visible, it's the project that means the most to me in terms of some of the work that I've done related to community. So I'm, I'm gonna, um, me and Olivia, when we were curating some of these questions, um, there was a, a phrase from a book that just really made us think of, of both of you and, and the work that you guys are, are doing. Um, Gloria Ansaldúa, to live in the borderlands, um, wrote, to survive the borderlands, you must live sin fronteras, be a crossroad. How might your creative practice, or how would you define your creative practice as being a crossroad, or sin fronteras? I, I guess I can say something about this. I have read um, Blanca's work, and I, I I think some of it is really beautiful, and a lot of it, I do find it very relatable, and I think she's amazing. Uh, I think for me, I've really thought about how sometimes even the way we think about ourselves can be isolating from other people, or people that are different from us. And I have really tried to merge my work so that it incorporates all kinds of people and all kinds of community, so that I, I am, you know, accessible to people that have my experiences and people that don't. And I think that intersection, that moment when we all meet each other and we're distinct and we have distinct backgrounds, whether it's economic, gender, whatever it is, I think for me that is a moment of growth, a moment forward. And so my work, for, you know, has really kind of thought about that within my studio practice nowadays and also just how beyond making things, we are also, we ourselves are living a way of, as, as an artist, and we meet people and, um, and kind of grow conversations so that the art doesn't end as an artwork, that it's really the dialogues that we built together, like today, making the books in the shop and learning from each other. So I don't know if that answers your question. I just want to say that like, 
that ability to not stay within one group, to be able to kind of move around and meet new people is a very important thing because it, it helps us relate to each other and learn from each other. Yeah, this, I, this idea of sin fronteras without boundaries is something that I have really tried to uh, incorporate in the way I think about the work because I am trained as an architect and there are certain expectations one has for an architect. Um, but if there are mediums within art, like you can say there are painters and sculptors and they, uh, or you draw, there are certain tools or ceramics or clay. As an architect, there are certain expectations. Um, but I, like, I prefer to think about it as a medium with art, within art, within the discipline of art. And the moment you think of architecture as a medium within the discipline of art, all of a sudden you are dissolving a particular boundary that exists between design and art. And my definition of those two are that design has no, well, design must solve problems. Um, and that's the intention. It has, a, it has enormous responsibility to solve certain problems uh, for particular individuals, clients. And art doesn't have those responsibilities at all. And that's why it's free, I think. Like, you're not responsible for anyone to say, like, you're you're doing this for this person. Even if it's, a, if it's a commissioned piece, you still have the freedom to do that. I think art doesn't necessarily solve the problems, but it can bring attention to those problems. But the moment you blur that, that boundary between those two worlds, I think it's something incredibly powerful emerges from that, that you have the capacity to decide whether you want to highlight, attempt to address, attempt to solve problems, or not be responsible for them at all in some way and bring beauty or ask questions. And by erasing those boundaries, I think it's, it's very special. For me, it's also a form of freedom. I think in our, um, so I attended both of their um, workshops today and they were amazing, um, fascinating. And I think you both alluded to um, a process of unlearning. Um, Maria, when we were in the workshop, I, I caught like something that really caught out, out of the comments was, it took me years to unlearn certain things to find my own voice. And yesterday, Ron, you also, when, when we did the exhibition and you, we were talking about the fuzziness between art and architecture too, and um, both of those themes really brought me back to like the political side and the activism side of your work and the part of unlearning that I think is, is just really beautiful. And I don't know if you guys want to expand on that, but I just wanted to like, even though you have very different mediums and do different types of work, that just really resonated with me that there was this unlearning as, as part of your growth. Mm -hmm. One thing that I've, in, in addition of unlearning is that there, there are a lot of expectations, I think both in art and in design of what a designer is or who a designer is and what they're supposed to do. And it often draws from a certain viewpoint, uh, a European vantage point, a particular historical vantage point. And I know when I was going to school, the, the ideas that I proposed did not jive with the, that philosophy. They did not resonate. They rubbed up against it very hard. I mean, fun, fun, I remember my first day of architecture school and we drew our first attempt at a design a building, I drew very, very thick walls. And I remember the first thing my professor said is, walls are not thick. From now on, all the walls that you draw will be six inches or four inches. I was like, six inches or four inches, but walls are thick, like, you know. And I was not allowed, and, and then you fall into these, these dogmas of thinking about how you were supposed to be a designer. And I've spent a, a lifetime of my career attempting to be that kind of designer, and it, probably 10 years ago, I decided to stop. I said, well, I want to reflect the ideas that I originally had when I left the ranch, and those ideas of who I was didn't apply to the work. And that's the moment when the work began to have attention, and people began to, because it was different. It wasn't every other six inch wall and every four inch wall, and you start to produce work that draws from a different lens, a different vantage point. 
and makes it special. And it took me a very long time to unlearn that or to believe that I didn't have to do, I didn't have to follow that path that was expected to me that would lead me into the status quo. That's a good answer. I guess I have a slightly <laughs> different answer. Um, for me, my education hasn't been, a, a, I'm not a contrarian to what I've learned. Uh, I actually love everything that I have learned. Uh, I got to go to Italy with um, the Advanced Barrel, a part of DACA many years ago, and I got to see all the frescoes, see all the murals. And I, I mean, I've been trained traditionally in drawing and painting and uh, some sculpture. And so for me, it has been more of a process of actually taking different aspects of my education that my teachers like gave me and then kind of thinking about how it comes together in my work. How does it, you know, how, do, how what does it look like? Because I think in a way it's a type of uniqueness and that type of uniqueness is in you, but it, it does have to do with a lot with the exposure you've had in life. And I've had a vast range of exposure growing up in, you know, Mexico, California, and New York. And New York really opened my mind to like, there are no boundaries between different styles of art and different ways of making. And I think for me, letting go of, of that idea of, of um, is not a contradiction, actually. I have taken things from various aspects of my life and various moments. So it's about, for me, it's about like, how do you bring it all together? And it took me many years to get there. I think now I'm, I'm starting to be really excited about what I'm doing uh, in the various aspects of what I make. And I still remember many of the things that I have learned and many of the things my professors have said. And now as an educator, you know, being the assistant director at the Yale School of Art and being a full-time critic there, I really think about that too. That I think there is maybe a slight friction with tradition, but nowadays we live in a very exciting time where that friction, it is there, but you have, as an artist and as a student, you have so much autonomy. You can take from any aspect, you can go on the web, you can like research other things. So I, I think it is a really special moment to be an artist and to be a maker because there are no boundaries anymore. And so for me, it was like, I don't know, I've always been very excited at every stage of my education and, and I'm grateful for every part that I've learned because I don't really know whether when it's gonna come back and like I'm going to pick from like Klimt or I'm gonna pick from our Chagall or Frida Kahlo or Diego or the German Expressionist. So I'm just, I, I'm happy to be who I am and, um, and to use what I've learned to bring things together. I, I think it's two different kinds of philosophy and I do think that education has some drawbacks because sometimes it does get a little formulaic but as educators, I feel like we're at the forefront of making sure that doesn't happen anymore. Yeah. And it's not about, I mean, I'm not suggesting like I'm denying the education. Certainly, there wasn't robots on my ranch, and there wasn't <laughs> robots in the boat. Like these things fold in to become a, a hybrid, mm -hmm. uh, something, something new. It's more about remembering who you are mm -hmm. as an individual and not attempting to mask those things okay. uh, for the benefit of of others' expectations of who they think you should be. I think that's really true because we, we had a few conversations earlier uh, that society does have certain expectations from us as makers, as artists, and um, and to like not necessarily go with those expectations, to, that there is a bit of progression and change and evolution does have an aspect of taking from and also rejecting certain things. I think uh, that's a great, uh, that's why I like your comment, because I think there are many ways to consider this aspect, this question of how do we take what we have now and evolve, mm. yeah. Which actually brings us to my next kind of, um, like where I want to guide the conversation, which is into the future, into us as a collective. Um, and thank you so much for you know, we dived a little bit about like how you guys got shaped and where you are today, deconstruction, um, forming your, your ideas. Um, how might your art and design impact our future? This is a big question, right? Um, we're all part of the tapestry of humanity and um, you guys are doing some very um, influential and impactful work. And you know, what, what do you hope to see and um, as the impact of, of your work? Um, into the future. I think you can go first here. <laughs> uh, um, I mean, I, I've shared this with all of you, or, or everyone who's in the workshop today, but 
I, I do have a, a vision for re-legitimizing a way of building that's a traditional way of building, um, making buildings out of earth. And that requires a lot of work in, in different ways because the work that has uh, emerged so far has existed within the context of, of art or experimental architecture or, you know, I, I've, I don't think I've done anything to make anyone in this room believe that this is a way that you might want to live. I mean, these are very specific experiences, um, but they're not everyday contemporary 21st century life. But I think that there's a way to design that future using this material and that the impact that that material would have is that it would reconnect a very large percentage of the population of the planet to their heritage way of building. The, the, and it would also potentially have impact on our climate. Like the, I really believe in, you know, when we think about the use of concrete or uh, the removal of, of old um, growth forests, and of mining, of those impacts that waste materials have had on our environment, um, returning to a way of building that is, um, you know, I, I will say environmentally friendly, but I don't want to couch it with like an environmental friendly movement. I want to couch it within the context of that this is how we have always built. And it's only within the last 200 years or so that we really flipped the way we've made our environments and how damaging that has been to the world. And that comes from a, a long um, practice of the advancement of human knowledge. And then at a certain moment, how capitalism has really transformed that human knowledge into a very different way of thinking about our environment and its impact and consequences. And so I would like to think that if we can return to a way of building that situates itself within 21st century life, that includes a life of capitalism, then we might be able to build in a way that's restorative. So that's my, that would be my big aspiration. And maybe this is the first time I'm vocaling it, vocalizing it publicly, but uh, it, sound, it sounds big a little bit, but it, thanks for letting me say that. <laughs> what was the question again? <laughs> How might your art impact our future? What do you hope to see? Well, I feel like it would be very aspirational for somebody who deals in, you know, for us to deal in the artistic realm to think that our work would really carry that much social change, right? I think for me, the work, we were had this conversation earlier about once you make something, it kind of goes on to live and like people see it and they take what they want from it and they read what they want in it and maybe it brings them some level of joy or comfort or they think about something new in a new way, a new type of reframing or reimagining what they're seeing or maybe changing their minds about something. But I think to think that it would truly change their minds, it would be kind of a, a big question. So I'm gonna stay humble here and just say that I, I just hope that people that see my work, they enjoy it and they find something in it because I find joy in making my work. And then, you know, if people find that there's some sort of social impact, then that will be great if that ever happens in the future. There are some things on my list, like I do think that teachers should be paid more, like, big bucks, we were, my husband and I were talking about this, how they're educating the next generation and so they're very important. And then I also do wish for some restructuring of the immigration system and the way that we process climate and or refugees in general, uh, as you know, as, a, as an immigrant to this country. But I also wanna say that I do find that it is possible to find, to weave your way through the system and use in all the resources in the community you have to like achieve what you want. So that's, I'm just gonna say like, we never know really if something will truly change the world, but I do think that art makes our life better, more interesting and creates some fun for us, so. I really appreciate both of your responses and, and, and your, humility, Maria, but I, I really do believe that art and artistic expression 
sometimes it feels temporary um, because we're temporarily right on this planet. Um, but some of these ideas that we're living with today were crafted thousands of years ago and they still exist in our collective memory. And I really see um, art and, and the work that both of you are doing as, as part of um, creating a, a, a collective and, a, and an imprint in our, in our future, right? And um, we manifest and we start to create. And like you said, Maria, a lot of people might take your work and it might become something else. Mm -hmm. But I think by setting intention, there's definitely, um, we can see it. Like I can see it in your work. I see a lot of hope. I, I see the political moment that we're in. Like if, I think your painting is really relevant to, to this time and, and moment that maybe in 300 years, it's gonna be so different and I don't know if the American flag is going to have the same value or not. It's going to be referred to in the same way. Um, the symbolism in, in your work might take a new meaning. But I really do believe both of you are really helping us craft a, a future and you're manifesting through your work. Yeah. Maria, you mentioned the impact that painters have had on your life and traveling uh, throughout the world. and. Now you are one of those painters. Oh, that is so beautiful. Thank but you. But you are. Now you are one. You are teaching at Yale. You're making this amazing work in the world. And you're impacting the lives of all the students and all the people who are studying your work. And I think that is um, important to be acknowledged. I guess this is the moment where I say something back to you, because I think that was a really nice <laughs> comment. And I do hope that <laughs> we rethink how we built and thinking about various ways of making architecture and making homes that are both beautifully sculpted and also very livable and how does that work and changing the code as well, right? So those are all the things that you're working on reframing how we think of space and, and how we build. So yeah. <laughs> so we all hug. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Virtual hug. So this is the first time we've met in person. So and we met at our opening yesterday. And um, it took us a moment to reframe, but like I do have seen your work and I, I'm excited to see the much more of the expansiveness of it. And um, so Thank you for having me on the panel. Well, um, I want to make sure that we have an opportunity to um, hear from our guest here tonight. So um, I don't know how we're doing on time, but we definitely have some time for um, some questions and answers for the artist here. Um, I can maybe craft another couple questions, but I would like to open it up for all of you. Sure. The, the, um, you know, the one of the the concept partly was the same material, which is in the vertical, that divides people can connect people in the horizontal, and when you make that change and you think about steel, in that different orientation, the conversation was: should it be the same? Should it be rusty steel, or should it be a color? And if so, what color? And uh, we did that project in collaboration with a group called Colectivo Chopeque in Juarez. And we did various color proposals just to look at the contrast. And one of the first colors we proposed was this bright pink. And everybody was like, well, you know, this is the color that's used in Juarez. Everybody recognizes it as acknowledging and remembering the women who were killed during the femicides in Juarez during the time that Juarez was the most violent city on the planet. And we wanted to acknowledge that even though we're using activism, uh, we were using play as a form of activism, we wanted to acknowledge that we were doing it within a space of violence. And so we chose that pink color to acknowledge, um, to make that same acknowledgement, basically. Another question? Yes? It's not really a question, it's just uh, like, sure, I guess. <laughs> I think I'm loud enough. Um, <laughs> so I just, with your um, answers earlier on, I can't remember the question, but um, how you were saying that now you kind of like came back to who, your true roots and then you're using all of what you do to create who you are now, I kind of feel like 
I resonate to you when it's a project. Like I take everything I've ever learned and every experience to like create the project. And I resonate with you in that after everything that I've gone through and assimilating in different cultures and different areas, and then finally going through grad school and finishing all of the, the work that I did and nitpicking what I liked and what I didn't. And I mean, my personal work life has been all over the place. And so now I'm in education. And um, I've also taught K through 12. And now I'm at the alternative high school. So that's also run a gamut of what I've seen. And I can say that coming back to my roots on who I truly always wanted to be has made me the most free person I've ever been. Because now I use all of the experiences to create, and I finally have the confidence and the courage to be who I uniquely want to be. And so I want to just acknowledge both of your answers for that. That was really cool. Thanks. Well, when I get a microphone, I get a little nervous. <laughs> oh, tell me. Great job talking. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, uh, Ronald, you mentioned in, in the talk uh, that when you first started college, you were told to build a wall six inches, and you couldn't build instead of thick walls. And I'm curious, this is actually a question for both of you. Um, what advice would you give yourself at the beginning um, when you were beginning to study to not fall into the status quo, um, as you mentioned, in the, the dogma of these stories? What, what advice would you give yourself when you're first starting on this creative path? <laughs> um. You know, while you were asking that question, I was thinking about uh, my mother who went to school here and my family's lived here forever. And when she went to school in uh, maybe first grade or whenever she started, uh, she didn't know how to speak English. And when she would speak uh, in Spanish as with everybody else, they would pull her hair. The, the nuns would pull her hair. And that's how they made them learn, Spanish, learn English by pulling their hair or whacking them on their, on their hands. And it doesn't make any sense. Like, like what, what advice, what, if you ask the same question to my mother, what would she say? Like, she didn't know, you know, she didn't actually know that she had any agency or control in that experience. And I, I didn't have any agency. I don't know, you know, and I say that because I don't know what advice I would give us. I would probably say, well, it's good that someone taught me that a wall was six inches. Because now I know there are two sizes of walls, you know, or three sizes, you know. <laughs> so it, it is important to take all that information. But I think, um, I don't know, that's a really hard question for me to answer. I think it would, I, I think maybe the best advice I would give myself is to be able to feel free to have responded and say, well, that's interesting that you're recommending a six inch wall. Growing up, all the walls that I experienced were quite thick. And let me tell you where those walls were and what they were. And I might have had a conversation with someone instead of feeling like um, someone was telling me to something that I wasn't sure was I was comfortable with or I was right. And so maybe just have that. It, it didn't feel like I had the freedom to ask questions or to have a conversation about knowledge. And so I try to carry that through as an educator to say, like, OK, well, tell me your experiences and I'll tell you my experiences, and let's see where we can both learn from being in a classroom setting with uh, a student and an educator. Yeah, I think that's a really good um, suggestion for people as they're learning and moving forward with their dreams and aspirations. I think for me, the most important thing is that I always tell people to follow what they want. Like, don't let anybody really get in front of you, you know? do pursue it because if you have something you want to do we have a very limited time that we're alive you know you just kind of have to do it you have to set yourself some goals some timeline uh, i think that for me what advice i would give my younger self i don't know i feel like i kind of did what i should have done 
I, I, I pursued my work, I worked pretty hard, I listened to people, I moved to New York, which was a great move. Um, I am pretty happy with the timeline and how things have worked out. And so that is what I have to say. I think sometimes we overthink things, maybe it, things seem very expensive or hard to achieve, but if you set yourself, set your mind open, apply to things, and then just see how things progress. If you don't, for example, I always tell, as, as an administrator at Yale, I always tell people, why don't you submit your application? You just never know. You know, what, am I gonna get in? Well, you have to let some of the universe kind of take you there, but you do have to put in your ticket. And so that's what I, I think would say. Just always be, take a chance. I know winning the lotto is like a really hard thing. I don't know about <laughs> playing the lotto all the time, but like take a chance on yourself. Like do apply, see what you want to do, where you want to be, and like where are those opportunities? Where are the hubs where you would have other people who will also contribute to that progression that you want as a career or just your lifestyle? Another, anybody have a comment or question? Sorry, I'm like, taking <laughs> so much. Sorry. I'm giving it to the folks on YouTube. Or, um, hey guys, I just wanted to ask you how you guys felt, like how your work has been received all the time you guys have been making work. Um, I feel like you have like a unique lens. And I grew up in El Paso, so I saw that seesaw teeter-totter like and I grew up seeing like that the fence and everything and for me like growing up there I didn't really make work about that because it felt like to me it was so that's like every day for me I didn't think about it in a different way but when I go like geographically move to other places I notice that I I look at them differently in a certain way I don't see them the same every day so how do you feel like your experience for both of you guys making work um traveling around, working where you are now, or going around, how do you feel like your work has been received and how your unique lens, like, lends to that? Should I go first? Yeah. I think that's a really, like, we've actually had this conversation in March when, when I visited about the distance with the border. I, I do think that my work, so there are a lot of articles that do talk about my work that is, like, much more political. Uh, my drawings, the garments, and even some of the paintings that do deal with th some of that content. Um, I think that I also make work that is much more different from that, that is maybe that deals with other ideas of beauty or the landscape um, through the kind of floral paintings and symbolism that I embed in my paintings. So I, I, I want to, every time that when I make work, I do want to broaden that conversation because I am somebody who immigrated here, I have made work that is heavily political or heavily talking about that kind of experience and thinking how to expand the lens because we do have to kind of change the way we think about global migration. It's not something that is happening just now or that will happen, but that happened back then, but it's something that will continue to happen in the future as things change. So I do try to expand how I am seen as an artist because I think I want to be free to make whatever I want at whatever time. If I want to make just beautiful portraits, I want to be able to do that or make beautiful floral paintings. Um, so I think that there is a way in which society or the journalistic or articles summarize an artist, and then there is much more to that artist. So I, I, I think people receive me in a way that they do see my range. They see everything that I'm making and how it can be kind of vast in its intention. And for me, that is really important that I can make different kinds of work and that they're not all just tied to the fact that I am, let's say, a woman or that I am this age or, you know, I think we should be able to be free in what we create because ultimately that's a good type of freedom to just get in there and play around with some materials. So I guess maybe that answers the question slightly. Mm. So how does the work receive? Uh, Depends by who's receiving, you know, who's receiving it. I mean, certainly, some of that work, uh, people hate, and they hate me for it, and uh, they hate what it represents, and that could be people from all walks of life, who. Uh, so, 
you know, it's been it's been received in a number of different ways. But I, when you make work that's political, I think that is um, it's. If if I said a little while ago that art has no responsibility to um, solving problems, I do think one of the amazing responsibilities that art does have is that it can ask very difficult questions. And so, for example, the teeter-totter, I'm not saying that's the right thing to do, and I'm not saying that it solves any kind of problems, but it sure as hell raises a lot of questions and makes people wonder, is that the right thing to do? Is that good or is that bad? Um, and so that's the, that's the nature of, of work when you make something like that. And that's important. And so in, in a way, it's not, um, I mean, for me, that's the beauty of art, that it asks, it, it helps shape our morality by engaging people in conversations to suggest, are these things the right thing to do? Are these the territories that we can move into as artists? Do these kind of questions are incredibly important, and in some ways, the the world of art is the, one of the last places that we can be free to ask those questions because it doesn't hold those kind of responsibilities. Um, no, no client would uh, hire me to design a playground on the border, certainly, and. If, if they did, it certainly would have to follow a whole series of rules and regulations. There is a place called Friendship Park, uh, and the rules and regulations of Friendship Park between Tijuana and San Diego have changed over time to the point where now the only thing you can do in Friendship Park is maybe touch the pinky of a loved one through several layers of steel mesh at certain timed intervals. That's Friendship Park now. But at another point in history, it was a place where you could have picnics, that you can cross over freely, um, and it, so it's changed. So I think, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, I, I know you're talking specifically about the, the more politically contentious work, um, but um, people seem to like the 3D printing stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they like that stuff, it's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Still provocative, I would say. <laughs> Anyone else? I think we're coming up to the end. Well, I want to thank you both um, for being with us today, and thank you to the Anderson Ranch and Olivia for putting this together. It was a wonderful experience. Um, much of community got to spend time with the artists, so that's beautiful. So thank you very much. And I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Thank you, Maria.